ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere, present of fill soul things, treasure of blessings, and giver of life. Come in abundance and bless us from every impurity and save our souls, so good one. What a mercy, what a mercy, what a mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and to the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us and save us. Good evening once again. I'll just pull up my, uh, I'll pull up the PowerPoint so we can all see it. Let me just share the screen with you. Uh, change it to the view and then we'll go from there. So the last time we start on uh, uh, slide 55, which is, uh, we talked about the, uh, we, we talked about the unity of the faith. We finished with the consecration of the gifts or the so-called anamnesis, the remembrance, and then, of course, the epiclesis or the descendants of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts, after which the priest, he points to the uh, to the holy bread and to the chalice, to the wine and the bread, and he prays so the Holy Spirit can descend and converts them to become the body and blood of Christ. This is the, the prayer that comes right after the, the chanters, right after the priest says, Thy own of thy own, we offer unto thee on behalf of all and for all. And you see this priest on the picture, he's raising the chalice <clears throat> and the plate, or the, the discos as we call it, by crosswise with his right hand on top of his left hand. And the people answer with the phrase, We praise thee, we bless thee, we give thanks unto thee, O Lord, and we pray unto thee, our God. Then the priests and the deacons, if there is a deacon serving, of course, they make three prostrations with three, uh, bow, three times bowing before the holy table. And the priest says every time, he says the words, God, cleanse me a sinner, have mercy on me and forgive me. Then starts the epiclesis where the priest and the deacon are praying together. But the main thing, the main prayer that the priest says secretly is the one that says, again, we offer unto thee this rational bloodless worship and ask thee and pray thee and supplicate thee, set down thy Holy Spirit upon us and put these gifts here at offered. And the deacon points out, Master, bless the holy bread. We said that the words Master, they refer to Christ, not to the priest, not to the bishop. Because in the Orthodox Church, we don't see the priest or the bishop as the antiprosopos, as a vicar of Christ, someone who substitutes Christ in order to consecrate the gifts, but rather someone who is ekprosopos, rather Instead of biker, he is the, the one who serves in Christ, with Christ, through Christ. And Christ is using the hands of the priest or the bishop, which he is the one who consecrates the gifts. Of course, the Holy Spirit and the Father, the Holy Trinity together. Because wherever is the Father, there is the Son and the Spirit. Wherever is the Holy Spirit, there is the Father and the Son. And wherever is the Son, there is the Father and the Holy Spirit. So that's why uh, the priest, uh, point, the deacon points to bless Master the Holy Bread. The priest blesses the holy bread with the sign of the cross using the, the, the sign of the peace that he uses throughout the liturgy and in various services to bless the people. And he says, and make this bread the precious body of the Christ. The deacon says, amen. And everyone who is in the altar, as a matter of fact, says, amen. Then the deacon points to the chalice with his orarion. Orarion, we said, is that little thing that the, the deacons are holding. Uh, it looks like a scarf. Uh, you can see it in, in the picture. He says, bless master, this holy cup, the priest says, and that which is in this cup, the precious blood of the Christ, of course, again, with the sign of the cross over the cup. And then he says, bless both master. And the priest blesses the holy gifts all together, saying the words, making the change by the Holy Spirit. And the deacon says, amen, amen, amen. So that's what we said about the uh, consecration. Because then we talked about a little bit about the Panagia, the Virgin Mary, because she's the first of the ones who are being remembered along with the ancestors, the fathers, the patriarchs, the prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and every righteous spirit made perfect in faith. But we specifically pray for her, the most holy, pure, most blessed and glorious lady of the cross and ever Virgin Mary, because she is the Ark of the Covenant. She is the one that uh, becomes the new Eve through whom the salvation has come to this world. If uh, sin entered through a woman into this world and with the sin, the death, then now through woman comes the life and the resurrection, which is Christ himself. We, after the hymn to the third of course, being uh, chanted by the people, we said that sometimes instead of 
It is truly me to bless the author of the cross, ever blessed and most pure most, and the mother of, of our God, or out of the cherubim. We sometimes sing the Irmos of the ninth song to the canon. Canon is that main service before the serving of the divine liturgy. We have a service called Orthros or Matins. Uh, in the Matins, the very skeleton, the very basis of that service is the canon uh, of that specific day. And every day there is a different canon. So in the ninth ode of that canon, we don't have time to explain what. One day we will talk only about the matin so we can know exactly what I'm talking about. We borrow the ninth irmos, or the ninth ode, to be sung during the hymn to the Tathagra. So this changes depending on the feast. If it's a regular Sunday, then we use this uh, song, It is Truly Meet. If it's a, a special feast dedicated to some of the, of, of the 12th, Feasts of Christ, then we use a different one or the course. So it all depends on the on the day and the, the season of the year. Anyway, uh, the diptych and the prayers, that's when the priest uh, remembers the, uh, the the saints, but after the saints, he also prays, remembers the saints of the day. For example, today is with St. Demetrius, we serve liturgy. So the priest, when we say to the Holy Prophet, Foran and Baptist John, the Holy Glorious and all the apostles, saints, as he would mention, St. Demetrius, the mere streamer, great martyr, whom we commemorate today, and all thy saints, whose supplica supplication visited us, look, or look down upon us, O oh God. Remember all those who have fallen asleep before us in the hope of resurrection and life eternal, especially, and he gives the names. Now he mentioned the names of the people who have passed away as Orthodox Christians. We cannot remember, that this is very important to understand, so pay attention, to remember during the divine liturgy, people who have not been baptized, who are not Orthodox. Uh, we can pray privately for people who have uh, passed away or people who are still alive, but they're not orthodox They can be whatever. We can pray for them in a private prayer room, but not on, on the, during the divine liturgy. The reason being that uh, participants of the divine liturgy can be only those who are baptized and only those who are living members of the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, which is the church, according to the words of the fathers, specifically St. Maximus the Confessor or St. Apostle Paul. Anyway, um, uh, right after that, the priest says, among the first, remember, Lord, his grace, or which, uh, arch, his archbishop or the patriarch, whomever is having the diocese that we serve, we remember his grace, our bishop, Irene, and grant him to the holy churches in peace, safety, honor, health, and length of this, rightly determining the word of the truth, or distributing the word of the truth. This is uh, an important uh, exclamation that right after the saints, right after, then we start, and, and the, the living in the departed, we can also remember uh, the bishop, because he is the head of the church. Wherever is the bishop, there is the church. There cannot be a church without the bishop, according to the words of St. Cyprian of Carthage and many other fathers. However, the position of the bishop is not the one who is ultimate in a sense that uh, he is a substitute of Christ or a vicar of Christ, but rather the bishop is there who administers the diocese. The word bishop comes from the Greek word episkopos, uh, which means episkopos in old Greek language, means someone who is the overseer of certain area, certain diocese. So the job of the bishop is to ordain. He is a successor of the apostolic grace. He has the apostolic succession upon him. And the way the bishops are ordained is the same way the apostles ordained the first bishop. That's uh, being done to this day. It can be only happened during the liturgy with the presence of other uh, clergy. Uh, other bishops, of course, and priests, uh, and the people who, uh, after the council, after the ordination of the bishopric uh, order or the priestly order or the deacon's order, the pre the people are the ones who say axios or it is worry, confirming his uh, ordination to be preceded and and finalized. Anyway, the bishop is being uh, remembered because he is the father of the diocese in whose name the priests are serving the liturgy. The priests are the right extended hand of the bishop in, in whose name they perform the services. There is always a hierarchy in the church which imitates the heavenly hierarchy because the whole grace doesn't come from the angels or comes from separate entities. It comes directly from the Holy Spirit, directly from God himself. So the people answer in each and all. Uh, then with one voice and with one heart, uh, we ask to say, grant us in one moment, one heart, we may praise that no longer will majestic name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. After this little prayer, the priest finishes, remember, Lord, the city, everyone who dwells in it, the sick, the suffering, those who are traveling, the captives, the salvation, and so forth. And then uh, after the, the blessings, he starts with a litany before the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer referring to our Father. And we basically stop here, what we call the unity of the faith, and we're going to 
uh, now talk about uh, the, the the Lord's Prayer. Today we're going to cover the prayers before and after. Hopefully we'll finish with our catechism on this topic because <clears throat> on the Divine Liturgy, because my intention is to, God willing, right after we finish this uh, this catechism on the Divine Liturgy, to of course always have a sessions for Q and A. However. We would like to use the time that uh, we will have for the catechism and for the Bible studies to be the time when we can actually dedicate some more time to interpretation of the book of Revelation, which will be a true Bible studies where we can talk about a lot of important issues. And you will see that uh, finish finalizing the, the catechism on the divine liturgy and entering into the interpretation of the, the book of Revelation, how liturgical the book of Revelation is how the vision that St. John had on island Patmos in Greece was actually a vision of the divine, the eternal liturgy that doesn't reveal only the future and the end of times and the coming of the second coming of Christ and the, the kingdom of heaven, but rather interprets the past uh, in a prophetic way, talks about the present, interprets the present at the time of seven, for example, churches in Asia Minor, but also talks about the future. So this is very important, and it will kind of fit in to the liturgical aspect of, of our catechism, which is the most important part. So uh, the deacon will say, asking for the unity of faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commend ourselves and each other and all our life unto Christ our God. The people say, to thee, O Lord. The priest uh, reads the following prayer. Unto thee we commend our life and our hope, O Master who loveth mankind. We ask thee and we pray thee and supplicate thee. Make us worthy to partake of the heavenly and awesome mysteries of the sacred and spiritual table with a pure conscience for remission of sins, for forgiveness of transgressions, for communion of the Holy Spirit, for the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, for boldness towards thee, but not for judgment or condemnation. And the priest does gives the exclamation and make us worthy master that with boldness and without condemnation may we dare to call on thee the heavenly God as Father and to say and then we say the prayer our Father. So yesterday I was watching and I think I sent you also an email uh, with an interview uh, that um, uh, was I found it in YouTube watching and there was one interesting question being asked in this uh, Orthodox kind of conversation these two people had. It says. Why, why do we, why did the humankind since always have uh, philosophized, has speculated about creating some sort of a perfect society, some sort of a kingdom of heaven on earth? And ultimately, you will see a lot of religions, a lot of cults, and a lot of utopias are actually talking about this um, ability to, for the humankind to create. We see this even at the very beginning of the humankind after the fall by the creation of the Babylon Tower. The Babylon Tower, not that they, about the, the Babylon Tower will be so tall and somehow get to the throne of, of God, but rather we will create a society that will be self-sufficient, independent of God's presence. And the very interesting answer is what the fathers are giving us is this is happening because inside of our DNA, we are all longing for what we call the memory of paradise or the nostalgia. So you see, being, first of all, beings of paradise in our DNA, in our collective um, memory from Adam and Eve to this very day, to the last generation, because we are all coming from them. They are our predecessors, our forefathers in a way. We have this remembrance of paradise, of this uh, true homeland that we're longing. And Christ, by giving us the kingdom of heaven, being impatient uh, of acquiring and waiting for this kingdom of heaven, we're trying to create other paradises, the paradises of whatever the world can offer. And this is the great battle, the great delusion that we all live in, where the devil is always constantly offering to different isms, different philosophies, different utopias, uh, fictitious solutions to our issues. And we know they're fictitious. We know that they're false and they're wrong because... All of the ideologies of the world have failed. All of the attempts of the humankind to independently create some sort of a kingdom of heaven on earth without God or independently of God have always failed. And now, because we're talking at this point of the divine liturgy, of the unity of the faith, and we're asking um, to commend ourselves and each other in our life unto Christ our God to now enter 
we are already living the, the, the kingdom of heaven. We are pre-tasting the kingdom of heaven during the divine liturgy. We are becoming liturgical beings. We are pre-tasting. We're entering into the state of paradise. Not the kingdom of heaven, but the state of the paradise. It's a very important distinction because the kingdom of heaven and paradise are not the same thing. The paradise is where every righteous soul goes now, but the kingdom of heaven is inhabited now until the second coming of Christ, where the final judgment will occur. And then we will inherit the kingdom of heaven, God willing. Uh, so th those topics, of course, not we're not going to discuss them today, but just to give some sort of an understanding of the longing for the kingdom of heaven, why do we serve the liturgy, and why the liturgy is the way it is. So unity of faith is a precondition for being accepted uh, into the unity of the divine Eucharist. So before we approach the cup of life, the chalice, the, the potidium, we ask the Lord to keep us in the unity of faith. The church is the one body of Christ. It must therefore have one soul, one heart, one voice. So this unity of faith that we're all one, when we are all understand the bond of faith and love in the same way, says uh, St. John Chrysostom in his uh, interpretation of the, of the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. When we talk about having one voice, one heart, um, and one soul, asking this unity of faith, it doesn't mean that we're depersonalizing the, the individual uh, who is attending the liturgy. Christ never diminishes the person, doesn't assimilate the person that he loses himself and becomes nothing or just melts in into God, but rather preserves his personality, his hypostasis, his uniqueness, as a creation and just enriches them to the point to get her to the full potential to the full measure of growth in christ it's very important to understand because in most of the totalitarian societies whether it's communism whether it's some cult whether it's some other social kind of uh, construction that people would try to create some dystopia or utopia utopia refer, uh, i'm referring to they all try to melt down the population. So everyone becomes a number. Everyone becomes a statistic. And even today, a lot of uh, powerful people in the world, the authorities, they talk about these subjects of depopulation, of, I don't know, eating bugs or whatever, all this nonsense that we are hearing all the time, just because uh, according uh, to them, uh, of course, being atheists, being uh, some of them even being Luciferianists, are relying only on their logic uh, about the survival and how the planet should continue to exist. This is the demonic aspect of it, that time over time over time, we have seen that, that they were never access successful, and people are still urging uh, to create uh, this um, false uh, kingdom of, of heaven on earth. So we don't lose our personality, but rather we're gaining more during the divine urge. So the one faith makes it possible for us to be nourished with the one bread of life. St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, for whom we talked, I think, in the a few Bible studies ago when Father Matthew talked about it, he says the following, you should gather with one faith and in the name of Jesus Christ, celebrating one with one bread, which is the medicine of immortality. Just to point out, St. Ignatius is one of those fathers who were ordained directly by the apostles to become a bishop of the church. So we see that the liturgy that we're serving today comes directly from the apostle, comes from, we read from the documents at the very beginning of the Christian church. So it's, the liturgy is not a symbolical uh, kind of action. If it was only that, it would have been lost throughout the ages by now, where we would have some other form of worship, not, not the liturgy. However, we see that people like him talk about the liturgy. In, the, in his epistle, there are many, many other uh, proofs uh, to just verify. Having received this one holy and apostolic faith, the church preserved it with good care. She believes it, the church, that in the same way as if she had but one soul and one heart. She preaches, teaches, and passes in the tradition in accordance with this faith, as if she had but one mouth. Just as the Son, the creation of God, is one and the same of the whole world, so also the proclamation of truth shines everywhere and illumines all people who wish to come to knowledge of the truth. This is in John Chrysostom, again, on Ephesians. All things are in common in the church. Our faith is common. Our hope is common. Our love, too, is common. The church, as St. Maximus writes, Maximus the Confessor he is referring to, is a type and image of God. God as creator holds all his creation in unity through his infinite power and wisdom. And similarly, the church binds the faithful unto one unity in accordance with the one grace and calling of faith. 
in his mystagogy, uh, the book of mystagogy. This bond uniting the faithful in, engendered by baptism, sanctified by chrismation, and nourished and made to grow by Holy Communion. This is why the only why only those who belong to the unity of the faith can take their places at the mystical supper. The church denies the unbaptized the food that bestows incorruption because she knows that if someone ununited presents himself dishonestly and takes communion, he will eat eternal condemnation as his punishment. Those who do not participate in the truth cannot participate in the life. Those who do not participate in the unity of the faith cannot enter into communion of the Holy Spirit. Our faith continues in the apostolic constitutions. This is what he said, because this is the answer that we uh, try to give to people, mainly our brothers and sisters from the Protestant denominations who don't understand why do we Orthodox don't give the mysteries uh, to them? Why cannot just they come here on, on Sunday and receive Holy Communion with the rest of us? And this is the answer because it comes from the times of the apostolic constitutions. It says, our faith, Quote, our faith is in accordance with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist confirms our faith. The common cup presupposes a common faith. For the same reason those who have rejected or distorted the Orthodox faith, and they were baptized, for example, but they have somehow have fallen away from the, from the one faith, the one teaching, and the one-mindedness of Christ, cannot commune in him. Holy communion is not given either to the unbaptized or to the heterodox. It is not permitted for outsiders to approach the divine Eucharist. And we should regard as outsiders those who are still unbelieving and unbaptized, as well as those who have been misled into a belief that is heterodox and incompatible with the faith of the saints. The church forbids heretics to participate in the Lord's Supper. We will not become sharers in the holy, this is a quote, will not become shares in the holy and the life-giving sacrifice with those who are those who are want who want to believe in doctrines other than those that are right and true, but with our brethren and those of one mind with whom there is unity of spirit and in identity, identity of faith. So we hear here that not just the unbaptized and those who are non-orthodox, those who are you know, let's say the her heretics or the heterodox. But that includes the atheists. That includes also even those Orthodox who live a way of life that is, first of all, immoral. Uh, and publicly, it's known about that. They should not receive, they cannot, it should not receive the Holy Communion. Every priest, if he knows that someone in his parish confesses, for example, that the Most Holy Virgin, because she is not a virgin, that she is something else, or he doesn't believe in that the, the wine and the bread is the body and blood of Christ. Those people should not even think of to dare to come and receive the Holy Communion. I had one case like that. This person uh, had issues. He confessed that he uh, had issues with understanding. He thought that uh, maybe influenced by some Protestant evangelicals, whatever. Uh, he was never properly catechized. He thought that the, the Holy Communion is just a, a bread and wine, and that's just a metaphor, just an idea. And I immediately following the apostolic constitution, I forbade him to receive Holy Communion. Since then, he has not received Holy Communion, and he shall never receive Holy Communion from my hands, and I think for anyone. Else. Not that he cares, but at the same time, I care that uh, we as priests, we cannot give Holy Communion to people who don't believe what we believe in. It's very important to, to, to understand that um, the unity of the faith is tremendously important in order for us to commune with the one body of Christ which is called the church, which is Christ himself. The church refuses to receive heretics to the Holy Communion. She also refuses to have communion in worship with people of other confessions. That's the Protestants, that's the, all the other confessions, that even though they call themselves Christians, they are not a church. They are the denomination. There is a huge difference. And when we're going to talk about the book of Revelation, you will see there will be parts, times, when we're going to talk about the difference uh, between what is a church and what is a denomination. Why do we have 40,000, 80,000, doesn't matter, Christian denominations in the world, or maybe in just the United States alone, we have around, I think, um, something like more than 40,000 different denominations. Why they're not a church, even though they call themselves, but for us, they're only denominations. And uh, they're real ecclesiological and, and dogmatical reasons why, why that's important. That is to... Uh, so you also, the church refuses to have communion and worship with people of other confessions, that is to pray with them. There are certain specific canons that forbade us 
they've forbid us to, to pray with heretics, with people who are not Orthodox. The church, however, desires and prays for the return of every human being in repentance. And she recognizes that superficial communion will harm the heterodox themselves and will also shake the faith of some Orthodox believers. Why will they harm it? Because we saw that as much as the Holy Communion is the food, is the nourishment, is the manna that falls above, it's Christ himself that sanctifies us and brings us, us into theosis, into deification and unification with God. At the same time, if we approach it without the fear of the Lord, as the priest, when he calls, what are the words? He says, with fear of God, with love and with hope, draw near. And then people come and receive Holy Communion. That fear of God is the essential for us as a precondition to come and receive the Holy Communion. If we don't have the fear of God, we should not even dare to come. Because no one is willing to receive. But the fear of God, that understanding that Christ is in front of us in the chalice and he is willing to give himself to us. If we are not approaching, it can be for our condemnation. The other reason is also if we give Holy Communion to people whom we know, even if they're Orthodox, but they live a way of, a worldly way of life, and they don't care very much about this, and let's say they still want to receive Holy Communion just because, if, we, if we're scandalizing our brothers and sisters who are living in the church according to Christ, and um, we're kind of destroying the hierarchy, we do is doing that piety that exists in the church is very prevalent for, for those people to come. But those who live in the unity of the faith are aware of the church uh, love for mankind. They're aware that her motherly heart goes out to every human being and they see how she burns with love for all, for unbelievers and catechumens, for those far from faith and those near. Then uh, the priest uh, after saying this prayer, he counts as uh, worthy to partake uh, during the, when he says this prayer. Um, praise the celebrant communion in the holy body and blood of Christ is also communion in the Holy Spirit. For uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 says, through both we are uh, watered with one spirit. Christ himself has given us to drink of his own cup. He has given us to drink of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, at the first celebration of the mystery, Christ took the cup and mingled wine and water. He lifted up to the heavens and showed it to God and Father. And when he gave in, given thanks and blessed it and sanctified and filled it with the Holy Spirit, he gave his holy blood to his holy and blessed disciples. This is the words, uh, interpretation of St. John, who is also in the first Corinthians. At the church supper, the priest, as he raises his hands to heaven and calls upon the Holy Spirit to come and sanctify the gift set forth, referring to the bread and the wine, chalice and the, the discourse, stands in the place of Christ. Then we did descend of the Holy Spirit when uh, this in the place of Christ, not as vicar of Christ, but, but as ek prosopos, in Christ. Then with the descent of the Holy Spirit, the bread offered becomes the bread of heaven. And all who partake of the holy body and blood of the Lord become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, St. John Chrysostomus. The Holy Spirit vivifies the whole universe. He stands in heaven and fills the whole earth. He dwells. Again, this is St. Basil the Great uh, quoting the St. Basil the Great. He dwells in his entirety in each person and is in his entirety with God. He does not uh, minister to the divine to the to the divine gifts like a servant, as do the angels, but with authority distributes the gifts of grace. Within the church, the faithful receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. More particularly in the divine liturgy, we receive the part, uh, praclity or the, the comfort of this Holy Spirit himself into our assembly and in our souls. And then uh, we ask for boldness and make us warrior master, that with boldness and without condemnation, we dare to call on thee the heavenly God and Father, and to say, surprise the high priest who brings men as an offering to the heavenly Father, because he's offering, uh, in offering his all immaculate self, he offers men who become acceptable God the Father, inasmuch as it is Christ, this priest who brings us an offering, or through, in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, we say, Christ, as St. Paul says, we have obtained access. And he has inaugurated for us the passage into true existence, having entered first into the Holy of Holies for our sake and shown us the true path, the son Cyrilus of Alexandria. 
So through his life, uh, Christ inaugurated the path of true life. Man is now able to regenerate in Christ and to become like the first for man, full of boldness towards God, delighting his actual appearance face to face. St. Gregory of Nyssa talks about it. And then uh, on the liturgy of St. James, uh, we say the following uh, prayer. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, that you have given us boldness to enter the Holy of Holies by the means of the blood of Jesus, having inaugurated for us a new and living way through the veil of his flesh. Referring to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 19 to 20. So since the blood of Jesus gives us the boldness to enter the Holy of Holies, we dare to enter and fall down before the ocean of his mercies and to address him with the words, with the prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And now we, we, we say uh, the prayer, and when the priest says the prayer, our Father, when the people say the prayer, our Father, all together, in some places it's being chanted or it's being sung, depending on the, on the tradition. The priest finishes always with the words, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Summer. Of course, this is from Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, which uh, happened when Christ himself was asked, how to pray, he gives this prayer and he tells us that we should pray without hypocrisy, without not like the Pharisees who were boasting, who were being proud about their prayer uh, and were in a way showing off to other people how they should pray and so forth. Christ says, no, do it in a secret because the real prayer happens in the intimacy of your relationship with God so that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand does, meaning that we should pray at every time, all the time, but not like the Pharisees, but rather in humility and humbleness. And the, the very prayer of Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, probably have heard so many times um, the interpretation of this prayer. And once when we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But it's important to know that this uh, prayer of Father is very important because in its on its own, holds on all of the commandments that were given to the humankind. And just in a very simple way, in a very eloquent way at the same time, expresses the, all the needs that the humankind has. I will just point out one thing. In English translation, when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, when the words we say, and give us this day our daily bread, that's a wrong uh, translation. And I will tell you why. Uh, in Greek, we saw, ton arton imon, ton epiusion, dosimin semeron. Ton arton imon, ton epiusion. Ton arton means the bread, and give us this day our daily bread. The word daily bread is not daily bread. Ton epiusion arton means above essence. Epiusion means that. In church Slavonic, we say chleb naš nasušni daž na dnes. Chleb naš nasušni. Nasušni is again, direct translation from the Greek epiusion. It means the words above essence. So it is not referring to the daily bread, meaning to the everyday bread that we need made out of wheat. Or eat. Yes, that's the bread, of course, that we need to survive. But he's talking about the heavenly bread, the manna, which is the Eucharist itself. So even before he constitutes the Eucharist, Christ, by giving this sermon, he's giving some sort of a prophecy in, in this prayer that from now on, especially after Good Thursday, when we're going to have the uh, constitution, if you will, of the Eucharist as we have it today from Christ directly and only being established firmly on the day of the Pentecost when it becomes the service of the church, becomes the center of the church, because that's how the, the apostles received the Holy Spirit during the liturgy, in the liturgy. Um, the word epiusios, or uh, daily bread, in English, I guess there wasn't a better translation, so it was adapted. I'm not saying that when we pray, we pray in a wrong way. Don't get me wrong. We should not change the way we pray, but I want you to know the original says the word for example, in Greek goes patrimon o antisuranis. That means our father um, And then he says patrimon o antisuranis ege estito to nomaso teto vasilia so genetito to thelimaso ose en urenu ke pites gis ton arton imon ton epiusion dosim in simeron ke afisim in to thelima tomos ke fin tsofor. Ton arton imon ton epiusion means give us this, give us today the uncreated, the the essential, the, the super essential bread. That would be maybe the best translation. But we use the, the words daily bread because it also refers to the somatical bread, to the bread that needs, has physical characteristics. But I want you to know this, that uh, everything is in the Eucharist. 
without the Eucharist, there is no uh, church. There is no what we call essential aspect of the church. The Eucharist is everything that we uh, that we um, that we need. So even in the, the the Lord's Prayer, I want you to pay attention to that. Be careful to know that the church. Uh, that sometimes, unfortunately, the, the English translation in the Bible, even though it's good, not, not saying, even in King James, King, King James Bible, those things can confuse certain people uh, because we cannot confuse the heavenly bread, that's Christ himself, the manna that falls and nourishes the, the Israeli people who are walking in the desert, rolling in the desert, and the daily bread that uh, we all need to, to eat and consume in order to survive, but rather the uh, super uh, ecclesiastical bread. In the Lord's Prayer, we address God and we call him Father and how exceedingly great is God's love for mankind, writes St. John Chrysostomus. What words are adequate to give thanks to God who gives us so many good things? Examine, my beloved, the wordlessness of uh, your and my nature. Think about what we are related to. Earth, soil, clay, bricks, dust. For since, this is a quote from St. John Chrysostomus, we, since we were made out of earth, we dissolve back into earth after death. So after considering all this, be amazed at the unfathomable richness of God's great goodness towards us. For you, an earthen creature, have been told to call him the heavenly one, Father, the mortal addressing the immortal, the corruptible addressing the incorruptible, the ephemeral addressing the eternal. St. Gregory of Nyssa marvels uh, at the honor afforded to man. What a soul must he who calls God Father have? What boldness is required? What sort of conscience must the person have so that once he understands who God is, as far as this is possible for man, he then dares to call him his own father? You see, this is a very scandalous uh, thing because the, the Jewish people, they never called God a father. They always called him the Hashem. Elohim. They would use words in order to uh, describe uh, who God is, but they never call him Father. Christ, he teaches us to pray to God and call him Father. He allows us, uh, he, he reveals to us that we can build a personal relationship. We can actually understand who true, who, are, who, is, us, who is our true par parent, and that is God the Father. So for the first time, uh, we see this revelation that God this God who was leading the Israeli people, this God who uh, created Adam, who evicted him from the paradise because he fallen, fell into sin, because God cannot tolerate sin. That's the reason why he evicted Lucifer and one third of his angels followers of him, of his, outside of, of, of God's presence. The same God who is guiding and leading the Israeli people through the desert. The Israel represents all of the human heart kind who will follow Christ. Those are true Israelites, especially today. And the same God is not just a God, some unknown um, uh, person to us, but the person who we can call a father. Of course, he in his essence still remains a uh, unknowable to us because no one can know God in his essence and that's okay he's transcendent but through his energies he reveals himself to us as a father and Christ gives this to us he says no one can come through to, to the father but through me and whoever hates me he hates my father who sends me that's very important to understand that uh, calling God a father is a tremendous tremendous uh, almost scary um, moment for every human being this highest honor was given to man by the blood of Jesus. This is why the faithful pray as the moment of communion in the immaculate body, blood of Christ approaches. Make us what your master, Lord, who loves mankind with boldness, uncondemned, with a pure heart and enlightened soul, a face and a shame and sanctify lips to dare to call up the holy God and Father in heaven and to say our Father in heaven. This is from the liturgy of St. James. The similar prayer is also in the liturgy of St. Basil the Great. In the liturgy of St. John, his ostomus, we just say, and make us for your master, that with boldness and without condemnation, we may dare to call on thee the heavenly God as Father and to say. But St. Gregory Nisha says also, if only people would know, when once when they know who God is, and, and knowing that they can call him a father is on its own, almost unfathomable uh, thought. The beginning of the Lord's Prayer reveals the adoption by grace, which we have received through baptism. Now we are the sons of God. 
be coming. As Christ says, please, when he washes the feet of the apostle in the mystical supper, he calls him, don't call me your master, your Lord, but rather I am now your friend and your brother. Christ, by offering himself on the cross and dying on the cross and resurrecting, and as, which is most important, ascending into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, he, by taking, resurrecting the human nature, he befriends, he makes us, he adopts us by grace to become like him in the presence of God, or not by nature, but by grace. So we are thought to proclaim the grace of our adoption. This is St. Maximus the Confessor. We are taught to proclaim the grace of our adoption since we have been found worthy of addressing our Creator by nature as our Father by grace. Thus venerating this title of our begetter by grace, we should strive to stamp the characteristics of the Father on our lives, sanctify His name on earth, taking after Him as our Father, showing ourselves to be His children through our actions and through all that we think or, or do glorifying the author of this adoption who is by nature Son of the Father. Uh, so this adoption, which enjoy, um, which we enjoy in the present life within the church, is the image of the eternal adoption which is to come. Uh, the holy and venerable invocation of the great and blessed God and Father is again, St. Uh, Maximus the Confessor continuing to explain, is a symbol of the adoption which will be stowed as a gift in charism or, or charisma, charisma, like chair, charism, it's in, in, in the way it's translated in English of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and which will be bound up with men's substance and being. In this, in that adoption, the coming of grace will prevail over and come every attribute of the human. All the saints, all those who already in this life through the work of the virtues have shown brightly and gloriously with the beauty of divine goodness will be called sons of God and will actually be such. That's the theos. That's the becoming uh, united, being one with God. Not to become gods uh, in, in essence. That's not possible. That's even heretical to think of. But by grace, by because of his uncreated energies. They are constantly over us. The soul that sets out for the kingdom of God, adorned with the divine beauty, becomes, it has kept pure, its correspondence to the image and has attained to the likeness, is led by divine grace to divine adoption. Again, the word grace, it's very poor in English. The word we, we use it in, in Greek is theahari, divine joy, grace, blagodat in, in church learning. Blagodat, which means something that was given, good given, um, a gift, basically. It's hard, uh, difficult to translate, but we call it grace. Grace is actually that, but it also means ithia energia, a divine energy, through which that makes everything alive, that makes everything put in motion, that makes everything uh, is stay in a state of existence, in a state of being. Through this adoption, the soul, which mystically and by grace has God as its one and only Father, will be led to the oneness of his sacred hiddenness, hiddenness, leaving all things far behind, and it will experience the things divine rather than knowing them to such an extent that it will no longer want to belong to itself. On uh, reaching the inner, uh, that's against Maximus the Confessor, and he continues later, he says, on reaching the inner uh, uh, recesses of God, the soul gives itself entirely to him, who in his entirety graciously receives it in, entire into himself, and in divine manner places his whole self in it, and thus deifies it, uh, deifies it in its entirety. This is deifies in uh, theosis. All human efforts to do what is good come to an end. The soul is not active, but passive. It ceaselessly receives from God the grace of his unending love. In the age to come, we shall undergo by grace the transformation unto deification and no longer be active but passive. And for this reason, we shall not cease from being deified by the Father who loves mankind. As John the Evangelist writes in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear that we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So we see that this is what he refers to become the sons of God. Yes, Mark uh, sends this quote. He says, First John 3, 1 John 3.1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that, and that is uh, what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it, it did not know him. That's, that's great. Thank you for that. Because the same is just what I quoted in First John chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Beloved, we're God's 
quote, Beloved, we're God's children now. It does not yet appear that we shall be, but we know that when he appears, when he comes, uh, we shall be like him. And of course, right after this, um, right after this uh, exclamation, the priest says the words, peace be unto all. People say, and to thy spirit. So, because now this becomes the table of peace. So each divine liturgy is a new appearance, a new manifestation, a new revelation of Christ resurrected. The first appearances of Christ after the resurrection are described by John the Evangelist in the following way. This is from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 26. Then the same day that at evening, being the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Kiriaki, day of the Lord, when the doors, because for the Jews, the first day after the was the first day after Shabbat, after Sabbath. After Saturday, that's Sunday. And that's why Sunday becomes the day of the Lord. So the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. And after eight days, again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. And then come Jesus, the doors being shut and said, peace be unto you. In both of, these, both of these appearances, the Lord stood in the midst of the twelve. The same thing is repeated at every liturgy. He stands in the midst of the assembly and gives us his peace for the, clo for the, closer, for the closer we come to the table of peace, referring to the chalice, to the body and blood of Christ, the more need there is for peace. You are about to receive a king who, a king, when you receive Holy Communion, this is from Jen Herzostomus, when you receive Holy Communion, and when the king enters the soul, the soul be ample calm, ample stillness, profound peace in our thoughts, which means it's filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, the comfort who brings us these, this state of ecstasy, the state of theos. The Greek says, let us bow our heads unto the Lord, um, to thee, O Lord, the people say, and priest says, uh, or recites, or, or quietly says this prayer. We give thanks unto thee, O King Invisible, who where the boundless power didst make all things, and in the greatness of the mercy didst bring us, bring all things from non-existence into being. Look down from heaven, O Master, upon those who have bowed their heads unto thee, for they have not bowed unto flesh and blood, but unto thee, the awesome God. Do thou thyself, O Master, distribute the gifts this gifts here is offered, and unto all of us for good, according to the individual need of each. Sail with those who sail, travel with those who travel by land and bear, heal the sick of thou who are the physician of our souls and bodies. And the priest says, through the grace and compassion and love towards mankind, of the only begotten Son, with whom thou art blessed, together with an all holy good and life in spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages, people say, Amen. So after the Lord's Prayer, after our Father, the priest tells the faithful to bow their heads to Christ. So acknowledging him as master and Lord, the faithful bow their heads to God, not only because he is by nature master and creator and God, but also as slaves who have been bought with the very blood of his only begotten son. This is St. Nicholas Cavasilas explaining. By bowing our heads, this is St. Athanasius the Great now, uh, Archbishop of Alexandria, by bowing your heads, we show the Lord our submission like grateful servants, but as his friends and sons by grace, we also show our thankfulness. For through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we have been made friends and sons of God. And he quotes, St. Athanasius quotes this, John 15, verse 13 to 15. Greater love has no man than this, that he may lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. No longer do I call, your, call you servants. The Lord of the servants became a mortal son of his own servant, namely Adam, so that the sons of Adam who are mortal might become sons of God. Meaning God becomes men, so men can become gods by grace. That's the famous statement by St. Athanasius that we quote uh, so, so, many, so many times. But before we uh, move on, I would like to emphasize a little bit on the prayer. So what we say in this prayer, we say, we offer, obviously, we offer a Eucharist. We say, we give thanks unto the King Invisible. Invisible because no one can know this King in his essence, but he is obviously present. Just because we cannot comprehend, cannot process his presence in a visible, tangible way that our brain can kind of understand, 
he is still here, because you can feel in every bits of our uh, of our existence. Who says, by the measureless or endless power, did make all things, the creator of all things, and in the greatness of the mercy, did bring all things from non-existence into being. Only God can do this. The magicians, the people who are, I don't know, teachers and whatnot, they can do things, but only God can create nothing, uh, can create something out of nothing. So we say, look down from heaven and master upon those who have bowed their heads to thee, for they have not bowed unto flesh and blood, but unto thee, the awesome God. Even though you come to us in the flesh and blood by uh, eating and drinking the wine and the bread, uh, wine, water, and bread that represents your uh, real body and blood, we still don't bow to, to blood and, and to, to, your, to your body. We bow down to you as God, because we see God inside. We, God, through this uh, the mystical Eucharist is giving himself to us. So that's why we say, do thou thyself, O Master, distribute these gifts here offered, meaning the body and the, the blood of Christ, unto all of us for good, according to the individual need of each. This is very important to understand. So, as I've said, every time when we go to the liturgy, we all come for different reasons. Yes, we all come because of the sanctification. We all come because we love God. We all become here because we want to feed ourselves from the source of life, which is Christ. However, some people have just been diagnosed with cancer. Some people have issues uh, doing their uh, prayer. Some people maybe have, I don't know, they're divorcing their, their, their spouses. Some people have someone died in their family. Some people have maybe joyful events that are happening in their life and they want to kind of... Uh, receive the necessary grace we all come for different so these gifts are being distributed to us according to the individual need of each because we all need you know so that's why he, the prayer says sail with those who sail travel with those who travel by land and by air we add above the air also heal the sick or dark with the physician of our souls and bodies that's why in the liturgy the greatest vaccine if you will the greatest medication against all the diseases is the eucharist yes the Orthodox Church is not against uh, the medication. It's not against the scientific approach to things. But let us not forget the only thing that truly, essentially heals us is Christ himself. The medications we take, they usually treat the symptoms. And sometimes they can help with maybe helping our body to fight off certain diseases. But the one who is the source of healing, the one who is the reason for our very existence, is who is giving us himself to us. That's why the Eucharist have has always uh, been um, miraculous for a lot of people who have been um, cured by this. I was serving for a year and a half in a hospital when I was ordained as a priest, and I've said, I saw a lot of uh, cases like that when people receive the Holy Communion, they receive healing because of it, uh, without me knowing that some of them actually had some infectious disease. And I never had myself any of, of those things, glory to God. Why? Because the liturgy, it's not a, out of this world. And when we approach it with faith and when we truly understand who we eat and who do we drink, who do we consume, then all the fears of potential, potentially getting sick or, God forbid, accepting a thought that somehow the, the Eucharist can give us a virus that can, God forbid, give us COVID or anything, it's almost normal. It's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because uh, if that was the case... Uh, the church would have ceased to exist the first uh, pandemic that happened in the in the and there were so many in the history that we can't even number them how many of them happened in the past 2000 years so that's why we need to pay attention to the uh, the prayers that the priest is saying here and the, the, of course what the, the church is responding to so that at the same time being rational beings we don't uh, we don't uh, we don't tempt god but on the other hand who is the one who we really want to receive? A source of life. And we need to also understand that sometimes the sicknesses, the illnesses, the, the reasons why we get sick is for our salvation. That, that's how God economizes our salvation. And if we accept the illnesses that God has bestowed upon us with gratitude, with, with thanksgiving, all the better because they will be for our salvation. The problem that we have today in the world we live in and in the culture that we're Participating is a culture of uh, self-denial, of denial of God, and of uh, an enormous Luciferian arrogance and pride. And 
Uh, it's all about denying the cross. And even as I said at the beginning, that we have this nostalgia for the paradise. And that's why we want to create all this, even though be false um, uh, uh, kingdoms of heaven on earth, through various uh, utopias, through various systems, whether it's communism, socialism, and so forth. Uh, we want solutions instead uh, of change. Uh, so we change the world, we change the, the medicine, we change the thing, and, and rather than trying to change ourselves. Because Christ says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And in order to do so, that means that we need to give up on our own ego. We need to stop relying on ourselves, but rely on God and follow our truth God. St. Porfirio says, when people come to me and ask me, what should I do when I feel depressed? Or what should I do when I am uh, diagnosed with certain very difficult illness? He says, forget about everything and put yourself completely in the trust of Christ. And you will see miracles happen. Of course, uh, it's easy to say, hard to do. But the thing is that we choose uh, the paradise that rebels against God. And uh, we rebel against carrying out, carrying out the cross. The very purpose of our existence in this world, the very reason why we call ourselves Christians is because we carry the cross. There is no resurrection without crucifixion. There is no Theosis, there is no deification in God without the cross. The cross is a primarily, and it's here because it's helping us. However, when we need comfort from, from, from um, the Holy Spirit, when we comfort from God, there is the liturgy. First take Holy Communion, then everything else. Then take the medication. They do whatever you need, but take the Holy Communion because it is only the Lord who can actually help us in this. So we all have the same Father. Yet the uniqueness of the human person is not annihilated with the communion of the church. All human beings are images of God, but each of us has his own character and his own struggle. This is why Christ is offered in Holy Communion according to the need of each. The master is one, the gifts are various. According to what is in our best interest, the Savior becomes different for each one of us. For those who need joy, he becomes a wine. John 15 verse 1. For those who need to enter, he stands as a door. Again, John chapter 10, verse 7. For those who need to offer up prayers, he is present as mediator and high priest. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Hebrew chapter, uh, verse, chapter 7, verse 26. For those who have sins, he becomes a sheep so as to be slaughtered for them. John chapter 1, verse 29. He becomes all things to all men, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 22, while himself remaining by nature what he is, according to St. Cyrilus of Jerusalem in his catechism. All commune in the same bread of life, and each receives him whom he needs in his personal life. Those, uh, this is from the uh, Doxastikon um, on the Matins, uh, 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 prayer by St. Basil the Great. Those in sickness, the physician, those in danger, the rescuer, sinners, the protector, the poor, the treasure, those in sorrow, the consolation, wayfarers, the companion on the way, those at sea, the helmsman, all receive him who everywhere ardently anticipates their need. Through the gift set before us, Christ becomes a rock of patience, a cause of consolation, a giver of strength, a provision of good courage, an assistant in various an availer for the journey of our life. For he is the truly good and infallible road which does not lead the traveler astray, but guides him to God the Father who is truly the good. This is uh, on his uh, prayer on the Holy Spirit and basically great. So uh, we'll finish, we'll, we'll pause here because it's 7.02 uh, and my time is up. So we can continue next time about uh, receiving the Holy Communion uh, when the priest the doors, the holy doors will be closed and the priest again prays uh, just before he himself and the deacon who is present serving with him will receive the Holy Communion. Attend the Lord Jesus Christ our God out of the holy dwelling place from the throne of glory of the kingdom and come to sanctify us as thou, O thou who sittest on high with the Father and he invisibly present with us and by thy mighty hand impart unto us thy most pure body and precious blood and through us unto all the people. And of course the priest is praying here and he is asking for um, God to have mercy on him so he can then uh, uh, say the words let us attend the holy things are for the holy ones people say holy God holy mighty and so forth and we um, 
enter into the moment of when the priests will divide. We'll talk about all of this next uh, Tuesday. We're getting towards the end. I hope we can finish in a couple of weeks the whole divine liturgy, at least this part. It's the most important. So we can focus on even more interesting things in the future. But for now, that's all. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, we can finish for today. Uh, however, we have learned today that the only medicine we need in life is the Holy Communion. Everything else is just a, a medicine that treats the symptoms. But the one who can truly heal all the needs, all the, all the true cause of our diseases is the Eucharist. Why? Because the cause, the root of all the diseases, all the tribulations in our life is what? A sin. Nobody's talking about this because the world has become atheistic. It lives in denial of God. And that's why to even mention the word sin is offensive to people. However, in the Orthodox Church, that's the first thing that we uh, discuss when it comes to interpretation and understanding the reason of our fallenness, the reason of our suffering. So, glory to God for all things. Anyway, um, let's uh, pause here. Let's stop here. God willing, we can um, continue next uh, Tuesday. Tomorrow, we're having uh, Bible studies with Father Matthew. Uh, I think he will uh, choose again some uh, some of the Holy Fathers. The last time we talked about St. Gregory, Gregory the Theologian. We'll see uh, which topic he choose next. And hopefully, once when we finish in a couple of weeks towards the end of the month, um, we will start with the book of Revelation. I think we will somewhere at the beginning of December or the last week of November. We'll see uh, how it happens. Maybe right after Thanksgiving, we'll start with that session. And I think it will be very interesting to see. We'll follow the book of uh, Archimandrit Athanasius Mytilineus, something that I think will be very interesting. For. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I think you wanted to ask something. Yes, Father. I want to um, I want to post a verse here, and I, I think... It's something you mentioned a couple of times um, regarding uh, that everything revolves around the Eucharist. Um, let me see. Let me do yeah. this here. Um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the verse. Is this the idea that you know Jesus therefore say unto you, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. You have not life in yourselves. In other words, without it, without consuming him, you don't have anything really. Exactly. Spirit. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. There is a, uh, I would say, kind of a, not a prophecy, but rather a, a, a intuitive understanding of the church since the very beginning, since the time of the first church. When I say the first church, not that there is a second church, but rather the first, first, first ages church in the first century, in the second century, that uh, as long as uh, as long as we serve the divine liturgy without ceasing on Sundays and on on the days appropriate for that, in the in the at the beginning the, the liturgy was served every day, and on Mount Athos today, for example, in a lot of monasteries they serve liturgy every day. Um, the liturgy will be served until the end of all days, and the reason why it, even Christ Himself, and not just in John, He also says in other places, for example, in the prayer of Saint uh, Greek. Um, um, Dialogos, the Pope of Rome, who uh, kind of popularized the liturgy of the presanctified gifts, he basically says that whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will abide in me and I'll him. Without this, without this mystical Eucharistic union with God, who he himself, he says, do this in my memory. He never said do this once and that's it, but rather do this continuously in my memory. So the church lives as a Eucharist, if you, let's say, technically speaking or surgically speaking, if we remove the Eucharist from the church, that's it. There is no church anymore. Uh, if you remember, even St. Paul, we, we think it's a metaphorically how he says, but actually he has a very, very close relation to the following. He compares the church to the body. And he says that we're all members of the same body. We're all parts of the same body. So I cannot just cut off my finger and expect that I will feel no pain. My whole body will feel the pain. Same goes for when somebody from the church suffers, we all hurt. If there is a persecution in, let's say, I don't know, in Iraq of the church or in uh, uh, Israel or Palestine or who knows, anywhere, 
the whole church suffers because our brothers and sisters, even though we don't live in the same, but in the Eucharist, we're all the same. And the reason why the Eucharist is the center is because Christ himself is the Eucharist. In a mystical way, he is the one who offers himself to be crucified again and who is being offered. He is the one who um, uh, is being served, but is also serving the divine image. We cannot explain it in more with other words, by trying to use paradoxes or oxymorons in order to understand that the uncreated becomes created in order to bring us to the uncre uncreation, to be explained into perfection, to, to where, where what he is, to make us all sons of God, sons and daughters of God, the children of God. But the Eucharist is the center of everything because by eating and drinking him, we, in a tangible way, we acquire... God, it's kind of a, uh, like a, uh, imagine like 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 a portal, if you will. The only way to get into the other side is through by by participating in a tangible way. Uh, Bishop Atanasiev talks about this in a very interesting way. He says, "Have you ever seen little children, uh, toddlers, who are, you know, uh, they still cannot eat uh, a raw food. They they need to be given everything mushed up and and kind of eating like that." kids who are like uh, one year old or, or, or even six, seven months old, if you let them play on their own, if you put little different toys in front of them, every each toy that they will touch, they will put into their mouth. Why? Because the way they want to know what this thing is, is by putting it into their mouth. They want to taste the thing. And they sometimes can put dangerous or stupid stuff in their face. And that's why the parents need to be vigilant, not to give them to play, let's say, with little Legos, because they can choke on them and so forth, because they think they need they can eat that. Because one of the very basic um, uh, perceptions of our understanding the nature around us and knowing the things as they are is by tasting them, by eating them. So there is a reason why Christ appointed, for example, bread and wine to be eaten and drunk, drunk as a way of not just remembrance of him, but he himself to be eaten, consumed in such a way. Because he is the divine manna that fell from, from heaven in the desert for the Jewish people. He is the heavenly bread. He is himself becomes the food, the mystical food that makes us um, little Christ, little participants of his nature. So in the same way, we eat and drink. Otherwise, he could have just said, listen, every time and you shout this word, we'll be in union. Because he's God, he can do that. If you want. No, he gives us a tangible thing, something that we can taste with our own mouth, something we can smell even, the wine and the bread, something that we can consume, digest. And we, as Orthodox, for example, in the Orthodox Church, we have a huge reverence for, for the Holy Eucharist. For example, women, even though that's not a biological impediment because that's not our fault, we have, let's say, a cyclist at the time, for the, let's say five days, and they, it's Sunday, they should probably, out of reverence, a lot of women, they, they don't even take Holy Communion because they think that if they bleed, they would not like to, uh, if, if by consuming Christ, some who bleed out Christ. Of course, these are, uh, 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 this is a faith that, uh, uh, this is done out of reverence. Also, the priest, uh, for example, I had a situation when priest called me, it was like a couple of years ago, he had some he had to go to the dentist, so he was bleeding, and so he, want, he was there, he was okay. He was he, can, he could speak, he could talk, everything, but he said, I, I would prefer not to serve. Can you please serve instead of me so that you know I can receive Holy Communion today? And I went and I served. That's how we seriously take this, because the liturgy, uh, the Eucharist specifically, is that very essential food we need in order to, um, to, to get closer to Christ. Uh, we can be, maybe we can pray, I don't know, uh, 24 hours a day. We can do uh, thousands of prostrations a day. We can fast, not eating meat our whole life. But if we don't take Holy Communion, all of that will be for now. Meaning the mysteries is given to us so that we can unite ourselves with Christ. And if you probably have all noticed in the Orthodox Church, we try to take the Holy Communion as often as we can. If, if we can take it every day, we would take it every day. Um, People only who have certain, let's say, who are under certain penance because of their own fault or because something happened, maybe they should, they can be under penance for a certain period of time, not receiving the Holy Ghost. But there is no greatest punishment for, uh, uh, let's say, an Orthodox. I remember when I was young, 
when my spiritual father would have uh, told me to stay away from um, Holy Communion and I would go to church, it was like someone cursed me with the most horrible curse. They're like, I cannot receive uh, Christ. And then you think twice before you, you're more vigilant next time when you go into the world and what to do and how to do. Um, it's very important to understand. So basically, the Eucharist is the center of life. And Christ himself, as you see, he is uh, that in amen, amen, or very, very, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have not life in yourself. Without this, we don't have Christ. We don't have life. You also said, uh, remember me on the Psalms 38, 4, 34, 8, uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. That's exactly what we sing even during the liturgy because we quote Psalms, especially uh, when we take the Holy Communion. Yes, and there are many examples in the Old Testament. There are many of them. Just the, the metaphor or the appearance of Melchizedek, this unknown king of peace, uh, it's also the, the prefiguration of, of the Eucharist that will happen in the future. So this is not just Christ only then revealing. He was revealing the Eucharist to us a long time ago. But now, in Christ, since 2,000 years ago, it becomes a tangible reality to us. So we eat and drink the body of, blood of Christ. Without the Eucharist, there is no church. Everything comes out of the, the Eucharist. When I say everything comes out of the liturgy, I mean... I'm referring to the Holy Eucharist. There cannot be a liturgy without the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is Christ himself. Christ is the church. We're all parts of him. So remember, always remember that one German philosopher, his name was Forbach. Uh, he once said, well, well, people are what they eat. So if I eat a chicken, I am a chicken. If I eat pork, I am a swine, I'm a pig. If I eat whatever, I'm becoming that. Because if, if you understand the human existence as some form of a, uh, animalistic, Darwinistic, kind of atheistic uh, being, then we indeed are what we eat. And we can smell. If I eat garlic all day, I'll smell like garlic all day. Um, if I eat certain types of food, then I will suffer from that. I will have issues. But the body needs to adjust. But one Christian asked him, said, well, what about us, the Christians? We eat Christ all the time. Then what are we? So he said, then you are Christians. The very reason why we call ourselves Christians is because we eat and drink Christ. We consume Christ. We carry Christ in the most intimate part of us, which is inside of us, so that no one can take away from us. If Christ was just an idea, anyone else could have uh, convinced us otherwise. If Christ was something else, we could easily lose that. But when Christ is something tangible and we can consume no one can take away that. And there is no more intimate way of relating to our God but by consuming him. He is consumed but never consumed. Uh, he is divided and distributed, but he is never actually divided and fully distributed because he is in abundance. There are prayers that we're going to read and you will see next uh, Tuesday. We'll talk about it as well so that um, uh, it will go in deeper into this mystery. But thank you for your question. It, it, it is important. Anyway, thank you all. Uh, we'll um, stop here because we have to go. Um, we'll, uh, God willing, we have uh, Bible studies tomorrow. We have practices on Friday as usual. Saturday, uh, Saturday we have one baptism um, uh, of a little baby. And then Sunday as usual, matins and, and liturgy. God willing, then I'm looking forward at the end of the month, we'll start with the book of Revelation. So until then, uh, have a good day, uh, have a good night, and uh, talk to you soon. So let's say the prayer so we end up uh, uh, today's uh, catechism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and even to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the praise of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us and save us. Amen.